In this presentation, we will discuss the basics of evaluating a patient with a complaint of chest pain. The learning objectives for this presentation will include 1. Being able to create a differential diagnosis for chest pain that includes not only cardiac causes, but non-cardiac causes as well. And 2. Using your history, focused physical exam, and an appropriate ordering of ancillary tests to help narrow that differential diagnosis. The complaint of chest pain is very common in clinical practice. It accounts for the second most common complaint in emergency departments for adults. Most of the patients will not have a cardiac cause of chest pain. Many will not get a specific diagnosis, but will be labeled as non-organic, which simply refers to symptoms not caused by cardiac, pulmonary, or GI pathology. Over 15% of emergency department visits are diagnosed as acute myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. Other common causes include musculoskeletal, psychiatric, and gastrointestinal problems such as GERD. The goal of the acute workup of chest pain is to rule out causes with high morbidity mortality, such as acute coronary syndromes, pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, etc. Here is a common differential for various causes of chest pain. As you can see, the differential is quite broad. As you work down various systems located in the thorax, you can start with the skin, such as herpes zoster or shingles, the ribs and muscles, such as contusions, costochondritis, or muscle strains. Next, the lungs could include pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, or pneumothorax. The GI tract, such as GERD, biliary diseases, such as biliary colic and cholecystitis, and pancreatitis. Finally, the cardiac system, such as myocardial infarction, aortic dissection, or pericarditis. When starting to think through a patient with chest pain, you will follow these general steps. The point of each step is to help narrow down your differential diagnosis. They are an initial triage, taking a good and thorough history, performing a focused physical exam, ordering any necessary lab work or imaging, and then triaging the patient with a diagnosis or to the appropriate treatment avenue. Your initial triage of the patient will be to determine how urgent intervention is needed, or in other words, is the patient stable or unstable. Checking vital signs and assessing the patient's oxygenation status are first. Placing the patient on a cardiac monitor is typically done quickly in the emergency department. Asking quick, pertinent questions about the chest pain and associated symptoms and performing a small physical exam is usually indicated when deciding the acuity of the patient's symptoms. If the patient is unstable, fall back on the basics of life support and the ABCs, which include ensuring the patient has an airway, is breathing, and has an active circulation or checking a pulse. Checking the monitor for any life-threatening arrhythmias is important. This list of life-threatening diagnoses should be assessed for quickly in chest pain as they require immediate intervention. Finally, ordering an electrocardiogram or EKG and chest x-ray can be done while you move on to the next part of the history and physical. Once the patient is determined to be stable, the next step is to get some more information. A thorough history is key and much of the time will give you the diagnosis. Similar to other types of pain, we need to know more about it. These descriptions can help narrow the differential diagnosis. For example, cardiac ischemia is typically described as pressure-like, may be located on the left side with radiation to the jaw or arm, and is worse with exertion. Pneumonia may be on one side, sharp, and worse with deep inspiration. Associated symptoms are also very important. Common complaints of MI include nausea, shortness of breath, and diaphoresis, while pneumonia may be associated with productive cough and a fever. Knowing a patient's past medical history is very important. This, along with other risk factors, will help to make certain diagnoses more or less likely. 
For example, a young, healthy female with chest pain is less likely to have a MI compared to an older male with prior heart attacks and is currently smoking. Another example is a patient presenting with a burning chest pain in the middle of the chest, started a few hours after a large meal. Pain is worse with laying down and better with sitting up, and it may be associated with belching. This patient is likely to have acid reflux, or GERD. The next portion is the physical exam, starting off with the vital signs. Tachycardia may be seen in pulmonary embolism, anxiety, and sepsis. Blood pressure should always be checked in both arms to assess for possible aortic dissection. Also, par pulsus paradoxus, or drops in blood pressure with inspiration, may be a sign of cardiac tamponade. Pain is reproduced on palpation of the chest. This may lead you to a musculoskeletal cause of chest pain. Examples such as Hamann's crunch or the feelings of air under the skin may be seen in mediastinal emphysema. In the cardiac exam, palpate the apical beat. It may be displaced or prolonged in aortic stenosis. You should assess for the rhythm, which is atrial fibrillation, for murmurs, which are signs of valvular stenosis or regurgitation. You may also hear a rub in pericarditis. Jugular venous distension is seen in pathologies of right heart failure, pulmonary embolism, congestive heart failure, or myocardial infarction. The pulmonary exam assessing for asymmetry and focal consolidations is important. Pneumonias, pneumothorax, or pleural effusions may be found on exam. Many abdominal pathologies can present as chest pain. Biliary disease, pancreatitis, and peptic ulcers may be described as chest pain, so an abdominal exam is important. On the extremity exam, you may see edema and heart failure, and you should always assess for the temperature. Legs are cold in cardiogenic shock and warm in septic shock. Calf pain and swelling may be seen in deep venous thrombosis, or DVT, and pulses, pulses in all four extremities should always be checked. After the physical exam, ancillary studies, such as the EKG and chest x-ray, are essential if indicated by the history in the physical exam. Guidelines from the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology suggest an EKG and interpretation should be done within 10 minutes of arrival to a healthcare facility if chest pain is the presenting symptom. On the EKG, assessing for the rate and rhythm is important. Look for ST segment changes, such as ST elevation or depression, as these may be signs of cardiac ischemia. An ST elevation MI indicates an immediate call to cardiology. Here is an example of ST elevations in leads 2, 3, and AVF, indicating an inferior MI. The QRS is important as new Q waves or a new left bundle branch block may also indicate an acute myocardial infarction. Looking for symptoms of right heart strain, such as in pulmonary embolism, can be done by seeing the classic EKG changes of S1, Q3, and T3, which means a new S wave in lead 1, Q wave in lead 3, and inverted T waves in lead, leads 3. Voltages should be assessed for for left ventricular hypertrophy, or electrical alternands, as in this EKG. You'll notice the changing voltages from B to B. This is a sign of pericardial effusions. T waves may be peaked early in ischemia and then inverted as the ischemia progresses. A chest x-ray may be helpful in assessing for pulmonary causes of chest pain, including pneumonia. A widened median stinum, such as in this chest x-ray, indicates a possible aortic dissection. Remember that in pulmonary embolism, the chest x-ray is typically normal. 
Laboratory tests that may be indicated include CKMB and troponin to assess for myocardial necrosis. Biomarkers may rise within the blood within six hours of ischemia, as the graph shows. Troponins tend to stay positive longer than CKMB. They can, however, be falsely elevated in chronic kidney disease or when the total CK is elevated, such as rhabdomyolysis. A complete blood count and basic metabolic profile may be helpful. A leukocytosis and fever may indicate infection. Renal failure may help with determining if other tests are possible. An elevated blood urea nitrogen, or BUN, may lead to pericarditis. A D-dimer is a nonspecific test that may be used in low-risk in low patients to help rule out pulmonary embolism. Other tests that may be considered include a CT angiogram of the chest or ventilation perfusion scan or VQ scan to assess for pulmonary embolism and to assess the lung parenchyma. A stress test or echocardiogram may be helpful to determine if the pain is cardiac in nature. After performing these tests, we once again want to triage the patient. If a diagnosis is reached, then proceed to treating that patient appropriately. If no diagnosis can be made, then one must determine if the patient is safe to return home and if continued outpatient management is appropriate. If the patient is not safe to go home and more tests must be done to rule out life threat and diagnosis, then consider admission to the hospital for further management. A cardiac rule out is a process of admitting the patient to a hospital or a specialized unit where serial cardiac biomarkers are checked and the patient is monitored for continuing symptoms. The symptom of chest pain is very common and the differential for that symptom is quite broad. The initial focus should be made on making sure the patient is stable and that the cause is not life-threatening. Further investigations, such as your history, physical exam, and ancillary studies will help identify a diagnosis. Given that many causes of chest pain can be life-threatening, early diagnosis or exclusion of serious diagnoses is critical. Here are a few excellent reviews of this topic that provide a comprehensive overview of the approach to the patient with chest pain.